All right. So as you heard earlier in the episode, Dennis Bernstein joining us, obviously covers the LA Kings, been on a few times the show, friend of the show for sure. So Leafs, Kings, we didn't get to talk about it when the Kings were in Toronto, but now the Leafs are heading out to the West Coast swing, the dreaded West Coast swing, but they're bringing a little reinforcements in Kyle Clifford. Do you see this guy getting in the lineup here? Or is this just because they're in LA, he's played in LA, it's more of a letting them see the guys and do that kind of thing? Yeah, I think it's more of a thank you. Uh, I, he skated with the extras today, James, so I, I don't think he's going to play. And he's just been called up, right? So I don't think it is enough. Look, he's a veteran. He Could he step in tomorrow and do a job on the fourth line? Of course he could. I think it's just great being around his mates. And he'll be able to see uh, Drew. Drew's not playing, but he's been around the team. He's wearing fedoras now, so that's going to be good. So I just think it's a, it's a comfort level thing. So I think it's nice that the team did that for, Drew, uh, for uh, Kyle. And I love Kyle from his time here. He's just a great dude. I uh, just to wish the best for him. So I just, like you said, I think it's just a thank you uh, for uh, uh, for time served already. So one thing I want to revisit with you, we talked many moons ago about Jack Campbell and his ability to be, sure. you know, a goaltender, you know, in the Leafs organization as a number one. And we, we both came to the same conclusion that we thought maybe he would be best suited as a, you know, best to one B situation, but mm-hmm. he's really taken the ball and run with it. I'm wondering for you, watching him because i'm sure you've kept tabs a little bit on him here and there and sure. you know, ask questions about him what have you seen in his game that's taking him to the next level and allowing him to be what he is right now because for Leafs fans he's absolutely amazing and one thing that i've noticed from him as a departure from freddie anderson is when mm-hmm. we need a big save he's there he's ready he does that save and he keeps him either a in the game or b allows him to keep that lead and keep the momentum going yeah, well, Jim, in the game, he does make the big saves. And that's the reason the record and his, his goals against and the save percentage is what it is. But I will tell you this. I don't think Jack's changed much. The team in front of him has changed much. Yep. They, they understand that they have to check some games and they can't win five, four games. This team is very different stylistically. I, well, I was up in Toronto, so that game, that was a tight checking game. That was a one goal game in the third period. And, you know, Phil Deneau scored a couple goals, widened the margin. But if the team in front of them now pays attention to detail, they check. And the bottom six has been solid. I think that's it. So the Stars are going to score their goals, whatever. I just think this, the, the psyche of this team, they're finally listening to Sheldon Keith and saying, look, you can't keep doing the same stuff over and over again. If you fail, you think you're going to succeed. That's madness. They've changed. The team in front of them changed. So I don't think Jack's changed too much stylistically. He's 30 years old, Jamie. That's the other thing. Yeah. Not like he's some 22-year-old. He has to work at his game like – the Jack Campbell you see is the Jack Campbell you're going to get. And again, I don't think he's changed much stylistically. I think the team style has changed and Jack's been the beneficiary. of it. And, you know, we talked to Dave McCarthy actually about that as well. Um, okay. Just the game for these guys here, the defense for, we'll talk about the least first here before we talk about the LA Kings. Um, you know, the defensive, I guess, responsibility, the buy-in from the, the big guys seems right. to be there this year. And one thing I've really noticed about the Maple Leafs, and you probably noticed this in the LA game, is they're, when the D pinches, finally the forwards understand someone has to be back. Yeah. There has to be that coverage. Someone needs to be there. And that hasn't been there for the Leafs. So, yeah, I agree with you. You know, the team in front of them has definitely been light, you know, light, light years ahead of where they've been defensively, especially with Freddie. But the one thing I've noticed, and, and I'll keep going back to this with Jack, is with Freddie – when we needed that key save in a key moment, it wasn't there. A soft one would mm-hmm. trickle in. With Jack, there's been a couple of games where he's been off, but yeah. when you need a key save, it seems to be there, which is great. And whatever reason, it seems like also his confidence level this year, where last year he was talking about, oh, you know, I lost it. It was all me. You know, those things seem to have gone out the window a little bit this year too, where he's more confident in his own skin that, hey, there's going to be bad games. There's going to be ebbs and flows but we're still going to get through it as a team. Well, Jamie, he's playing for a contract too, right? I mean, so that, that has a lot to do with it, a lot to do with it. And the comparable, they keep talking about the comparables, and the comparable is Cal Peterson, who right now is the second string goalie in LA. But $5 million per year for three years, that's what the comparable would be for a guy like Jack Campbell. So I think the focus, I think that the money's on the line for Jack. Like, this yeah. is it. Like, if he had a bad season at 30 years old, like, then he's destined to be a backup. Now he, you know, he... I'm not sure how much they could pay him given the salaries on this team, but uh, he's in a contract year. And so do I think contract year 
Uh, Campbell has been better than the other guy. Yeah, he has been. But again, I think it's a collective effort. When you're this good defensively and you check like that, you're not going to give up a lot in this league, no matter who you play. So yeah, credit to Jack totally for you know grabbing on the opportunity and 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 see you know and plus Morazic's been hurt, so like what a shock that is. So when you came into the season, you yeah. would have thought that okay, I want to see Peter Morazic because when Peter was good, he's really good, but he's, he can't get on the ice. So to me, this is a maturation for Jack Campbell, but he's not doing it alone. It's not like he's standing on his head every night. Um, he's getting support from his team, and you mentioned Jamie, their support on defense when they pinch because this is an aggressive team offensively is right there. So like you know that definitely helps as well. One thing more on Jack Campbell before we switch off and, and talk about the the Leafs uh, as a whole here. Um, would you be comfortable with Jack Campbell? The, the deal that I've seen thrown around a lot for Jack, and obviously we're all armchair GM. We don't get to yeah. sign the paper or put the offer out there, but four years, four and a half mil. Obviously, sure. it, it gives yeah. him the same kind of thing with Cal Peterson, but obviously you get the extra year at a four and a half mil, which will bring the term down a little bit for the Leafs. You know, I, I'd be comfortable with that. 34 years coming out of that. And, so yeah, I think I think fine. Well, it depends when you want the timing of it. Do you want do you want a larger body of work in this season? Do you want to go to the postseason and, yeah. and roll the dice? I don't think they do because I think this is a guy who, you know, he has the talent, right? And yeah. you mentioned the confidence issue, right? The confidence issue, now he's more confident. Guess what? A better team in front of him defensively is going to help his confidence. So I think if that was the term and the AV, I think the Leafs and fans should be very comfortable with it because he can be that type of goaltender over time. Oh, definitely. Well, the other thing I want to ask you about the Toronto Maple Leafs, obviously, we talked about it just for a moment there. The buy-in on defense is there. Do you notice, though, there's more pushback from this squad this year? They're, they're not as soft as, I guess, the the term used to be. This team used to be such an easy pushover kind of team. You know, you have guys like Hyman or Muzzin when Hyman was there. You know, that would be kind of more of the muscle. Clifford when he was there as well, Simmons. But this year, it seems to be they're not as easy to roll over as they were. You know, they're grinding it out more. They've learned how to do those different things. And they bought into Sheldon Keefe's way of doing it. But do you notice that yourself? Or is that just something maybe that I'm pulling out of thin air here? You know, we were talking at Kings practice today. I think the key to this team with respect to the, their grit is their third line. Now, granted, it's not the Tampa Bay third line from last season. No. It's not Gord, Coleman, you know, and, and Barkley Goodrow. But I think that's a big difference on this team. They're, and and I talked to Tom McCollum about this in LA about like power plays, but but it's also when that team, when that unit goes out on the ice. They don't, you don't lose momentum. You're not getting overrun and you're not getting, having to handle six scoring chances when they go on the ice. So I think that's the key. The bottom six is definitely better. It's tougher. It's more physical. I think teams are learning the lessons. Again, the Tampa Bay third line is, is an anomaly, but it's like, that's the type of that you need. You can't just put 12 skate. This is not the Canadian Olympic team when John DeVars are going to be on the fourth line, right? I mean, this is not it. This, this yeah. is going to be a situation where you need role players that accept their role. That's why the Rangers are doing well. Not only that, Shuturk had been crazy in that. But Unreal. I think that's that's the difference with respect to the Leafs is that these guys have – you mentioned the buy-in. And the buy-in isn't just on the top line with the big boys. It's from forward one to forward 12. Everybody's bought into the system. And when it clicks, the other team doesn't get a lot of, lot of opportunities. Jack doesn't have to face that many hard shots in the game. So, yeah, it, it is a – it's a different, tougher team. And that's why when the Kings went up there, again, it was a close game. And I was like, oh, wow, this team is definitely finishing on their checks. And, and it's not just the top guys. I think it is the, the middle six that they have. But they're at least they're not losing momentum on shifts. And I think that's important when you have an ebb and flow of a game. No, definitely. Well, we talked for a long time here in Leafland, and you probably heard the rumbling, Sue. Sheldon Keefe was looking for a line like that for a third line. He tried Kerfoot there, McKayev there. Every mm-hmm. He cycled a whole bunch of guys through that. Now you have David Camp. Which is to me, Philip the no light. Um, you know, he can't, he doesn't have the offense Deneau does, no. but he definitely has the face off and defensive prowess like Deneau does. And I think that's what Keith was trying to replicate because we know that Deneau is the kryptonite to the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah. Was in the playoffs, shut down Matthew, shut down Tavares, did all that. And then, of course, he comes in with LA and does the exact same thing again and puts a cherry on top to score two goals. See you later. So, you know, Kyle Dew was looked in the offseason. So, what can we get? That is comparable to that, but obviously Camp doesn't bring the offensive punch. But here's the thing. Him and Kasha seem to have found a little stride because Andre Kasha, for all the injury worries, is actually scoring goals. Now they just need to find whatever is going to be the third complement on that. But I think Keith has finally found a third line where he can go, this is my defensive line. And the Leafs haven't had that. And that gives them a little bit of an identity. And like you said, they don't lose momentum. Nine times out of ten, they win the faceoff and they're grinding it out against the top players in the other zone, which is great for the Toronto Maple Leafs. 
Well, believe me, Mark Masters brought up Phil Deneau's success when he had Phil out there today in the immediate availability for so, so sure. And he's very, he, Phil's a great guy since he came to LA Alley. And you're right, he's filled a certain role. He's not the, he's not a big scorer either. Remember, I think I joked, I think his two goals in Toronto from 18 inches total, right? He was right in front of the net. One, one they had eight. to review for a, right? They, one they had to review for a kick. So, yeah. so, but you need that. So, and it's not even about constructing that perfect three, it's about tandems. Yep. Right? Like the nose now paired with I follow and they've done, they've had their partnership has been great. So that, yeah, the tandem that you have in Toronto and third line. Yeah. You, you can substitute and you can flip around. Like if you, if you want a more offensive play, you're going to pick that in. If it's a, if you're having a face off in your own zone with two minutes to go, you put a more de- defensive winger out there. So yep. I think that's the key is finding a partnership that works on the third line with guys that understand and know their role and are willing to do it. So obviously Toronto coming in to play the LA Kings tomorrow night, um, the West coast swing for, any team coming from the east side is, you know, always a dreaded trip. Um, you know, it used to be Death Valley or Death Row, whatever you yeah. wanted to call it. Everybody got a nickname for it. Um, for the Maple Leafs coming in to face the LA Kings, what are they facing? What, are they, what is LA going to bring tomorrow night that the Toronto Maple Leafs are going to be like, this is what is going to be our kryptonite? I, well, first of all, it's going to be a one-goal game. I think the Kings have played 12 one-goal games, right? And that's good oh, when really? you're playing. Yeah, I think it, it's, it's that. It's some crazy number. And um, that's okay when you're playing Washington and Carolina. It's not okay when you're playing the Coyotes. And that's the issue is that this team, again, they are much better. Like, like last year, I'll give you an example. Last year, Kings going to Scotia Bank to play Leafs. They're, they're playing a 1-3-1 one, one and trying to back off. Like they're trying not to get overrun. This yep. year, they're much more aggressive. There's more talent on the roster. And like the Leafs, they're checking. They've checked very, very well. Like they, they've lost four in a row, but one of them in, in Winnipeg, they played a great game. Winnipeg really didn't have much all, all game. The, the power play for the Kings hasn't been good. They went up giving a shorthanded goal up and we'll wound up losing in overtime. But this is going to be, I think, a low scoring checking game because I think that's the style of both teams right now. So they're a highly competitive. They haven't been blown out of at one. They've been blown out of one game this year against St. Louis because their penalty kill gave up three goals. But this is going to be a tight checking, I think, low scoring event. Um, I assume Quick's going to be a net, and Quick's got amazing stats. You think he's he's top five in goals against? I think top ten in save percentage. When I asked him about that, he's like he starts throwing f bombs, saying it doesn't even matter. Like what matters is wins. Yeah. So I think you've seen, yeah. Do you buy into that because it's an Olympic year? He's looking at his numbers, maybe wanting a medal around his neck, or is yeah, that kind maybe. Of out of the I don't know. I, I, do I really think that the U.S. team is going to be the Canadian team? No, I don't. I don't think they're going to. Oh, really? Team. Because yeah. I, well, I, no, I, I'm the other way. I think the U.S. team would hand it to the Canadian team in oh, a final. And I'm Canadian. I just think the death oh, yeah. Well, no, I, I don't. I'm not even. I don't think John will make the team. I, I think John makes the team as a third because I'll give you the two goalies, Hellebuck and Gibson, and Quick's not. I, I mean, maybe to have in the room as a third goalie or whatever. So I, I don't think he's looking at that. I think he's looking at the end of his career, and I think it's been injury issues. And the team, like like with Jack Hill, the team wasn't good in front of him the last two years. Yeah. This is a better quicker team see this team can skate with other teams that's when they played like a Colorado last year at the end of the season like 6-1 it wasn't competitive they can skate because they have the younger guys like uh, uh, the defense is more mobile a uh, guy like Kupari on the third line is a really big fast kid he's not a big time goal scorer but Ethan the CEO is fast more can skate so this is a skating team Pepe's always been a great skater so I think you're going to see again I think it's going to be a low scoring checking affair maybe the better goalie that wins so what do the Leafs have to do? I think if the Leafs can, you know, draw some penalties again on the power play, I think that's going to help because the Kings penalty kill is a, still a little bit of the motion. The Kings power play, I, I think when you have scoring opportunities against the Kings right now, you take the penalty because I think they're like two for 27 over the last five or six games. It hasn't been good. And that's because there isn't that, like possibly Arthur Kaliev could be that natural goal scorer. But when you look at the personnel on the power play, they don't have a Nylander. They don't have a Mourner. They don't have, you know, they certainly don't have an Austin Matthews. I mean, I love Kopitar, good friend of mine, but he's not that type of player. So I think that what you look at that is that, like, you should be able to shut the Kings down at this point in time yeah. um, and not be afraid to go in the box and on, you know, big time scoring changes on the high danger chances. If it's a two on one, you want to take a penalty. They've really suffered because what? No Drew Doughty. And Drew was on the ice today. He's been in a non contact jersey. He's been on the uh, ice for a week after that knee sprain. I asked Todd today. Drew had asked, you know, to be to put in the game. He goes, absolutely. He goes, last week he wanted to go in the game, but he's at least a couple of weeks away. So, again, I, I think if the Leafs can find their offense, I think they got a good shot at a revenge work, uh, victory tomorrow night. 
I, listen, I look forward to that. Obviously, a one-goal game is still going to be exciting because there's going to be lots of different chances and things going on in that game. Uh, talk about Drew Doughty for a second. We talk about a, a, you know Jack Campbell playing for a contract, wants to get noticed as well on a grander stage, probably won't get a sniff at the Olympics. Uh, so mm-hmm. many guys ahead of him. Me and Josh sure. had that conversation earlier. But Drew Doughty obviously wants to get back on the ice because he wants to be on that Olympic team. I think that's one thing that drives Drew. And he was doing really well this season before the injury. Um, you know, obviously the coach protecting the player there. For you, do you see Drew Doughty getting to be a part of the Olympic squad? Or is that kind of sunset for Drew Doughty? And maybe no matter what he does right now, there's too many guys ahead of him. Mm, uh, it depends how he plays on, the, on his return. Like if he's going to come back in the middle of December – and play well because he did have a great start. He was motivated. He was just motivated from the Olympics, from people saying he was done, and he wanted to show people. He says that every year, but I think this year he came through. So, look, do I think that Drew Doughty is one of the seven best defensemen in Canada? I do. I do. I think when he's on his game, he is. Right? Not the guy from last year or two years ago. This year, yeah, I think when he's at his best, I think he's an Olympic player. And, yes, he, and he, the thing about Drew, he's like totally transparent. He said, I want to be on the team. I'm offended at people saying I'm, I'm done and I oh, shouldn't yeah. be on the Olympics. I want that for my player. So he's a true leader. And I think that if he comes back in the short period of time, ran a short runway between when he comes back and when they're going to make the selections and when they play. But I do think when, if he's 100%, I think the guy's will to win the way he burns on the ice. I think you want that player in the room uh, with respect to Canadian Olympic team. So I would have no problem. We made it. I don't think it's a, it's a reputation play. I think he's playing that good, at least the start of the season. No, well, that's what I just said. Right off the beginning of the season for him, he was doing really well. Yeah. And obviously, if he kept that pace up, which definitely with Drew Doughty, where he, when he's motivated and ready to go, that's the Drew Doughty you get. So yeah. obviously, he's chomping at the bit to get back. And we talked about a few other players that are on a roll right now that probably won't get a sniff just because yeah. of the way things go, like uh, Andrew Mangiapane for Canada, sure. uh, Troy Terry for the Anaheim Ducks. You know, guys that may not even – like Troy Terry, you don't know, because those lists went in two – what is it, two games into the season? Yeah, I think those lists, the long list were submitted. So he may not even been on that long list, maybe because he was a part of the program before. But um, you, you talk about Johnny Quick maybe being the third goaltender, um, you know, and maybe a little bit of motivating factor there. Uh, for me, I would say it's Hellebuck, Gibson, and probably Spencer Knight. They want to bring along the young pup and, and show yeah. him what it's like on the Olympic scene, kind of like Canada and Flurry. Uh, I wonder what your thoughts are there. Well, they want to groom him for the future, I, I guess so. Um, but I think it's yeah I, I should see with a player like quick you have to have a conversation right hey john you're not going to play we want you on the team you're a legend you're the goat in la do you want to come along to beijing because i'm going to tell you the experience of the players in beijing isn't going to be the greatest they're going to have massive testing yeah. they're going to be locked down in the olympic village like to me I, look to this day i would wish they would opt out by january 10th i don't think it makes any sense I don't like it. I, I'm not going to, I'm not waking up at four o'clock in the morning to watch China play the U S and lose 17 to nothing. Yeah. That's generous. <laughs> that is generous. Well, there's some talk about them not even competing and putting Norway in. Right. So like, and when it's, you know, when it's 10 hours away on, from a time zone standpoint, like, I don't care. Like when it's North America, the games in Vancouver. So like, I get it. I understand it for now. I, I think we should be concentrating on this season and getting this thing the cup awarded and doing all the other things for NHL hockey. Like, but you know, the players collectively bargain for it. I have no problem with it. It yeah. just wouldn't be the direction I would go. And again, it's a sliver of the players. It's what, I don't know, 10%, 5% of the players. Yeah. I mean, we should be paying attention to this, like getting this come. And plus with all this, now there's COVID issues again, which is an entirely different story. I don't think the protocol is being handled correctly. I think there's way too much testing. Um, so I, again, like if you want Jonathan Quick, let him decide if he wants to be on the team if there's a spot for him. If not, Spencer Knight, sure, why not? Get him, get him some experience in international play. He won't be playing, uh, but sure, that's a nice option as well. I mean, he could play versus China. Yeah. <laughs> right, like there, there's a game right there. Like I, I'm not trying to be rude, but there is a game no, right there yeah. where he could get international 100%. experience. Yes. Oh, right. definitely. I mean, another guy, American goaltender, uh, we just talked about him, Jack Campbell, uh, having a great season. Could get yeah. the opportunity, never know. Um, for me, I'll hot take it right now, guys. There, we're not going to the Olympics. It's not happening. Oh, you're I don't wrong. think it's happening. I don't think it's happening. You look at the Ottawa Senators' COVID protocol. The yeah. New York Islanders are starting to hit COVID protocol right now. Uh, Zidane Chara just got added to their list today. Uh, so they got a bunch of guys out for it. 
for whatever reason, I, I just have a gut feeling that there's going to be enough of games missed or problems arising with COVID that they're not going to end up going to the games. I think they're going to opt out. And I, I don't want that. I want, I want Canada to go. I want, obviously. But then here's the other side of the thing, too. Everybody knows about this. The U.S. and Canada may actually just boycott the games politically. Yeah. So yeah, so might they diplomatically they might, but I don't. I don't yeah. think that's going to affect the uh, the athletes going. Um, but again, I just think, and the COVID thing is look, and not only that, like now it's going to affect the All Star weekend because the players can't be out and about in Vegas because they're getting on a charter flight to Beijing right after the yeah. the All Star weekend. So it's not that enjoyable. So again, I think there's a, there's a lot of heavy lifting. And I don't see what the benefit is other than, you know, 15, 20 guys putting a gold medal around their necks. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't see it. I, I just, I, I, this year of all years, I don't see it. I don't get it. And Jamie, I would agree with you. I think that um, when you look at the big picture of what needs to happen with respect to this, this league, like the Olympics isn't really high. It's, it's that, look, I've been against it the entire time and I've been wrong. They're going to go. I get it. I'm empathetic towards it because again it was in the cba and that was part of the like they got us another year five years of labor peace so i'm not gonna say oh they're wrong whatever i think they opted for it but i think that the guys experiences over there when i'm eager to see when they come back if they really enjoyed it it's really like the olympics that they knew back when it was the golden goal and the other games like that yeah i I kind of fall on the other side of this because i look at this and i go should they be going no probably not is it scheduled yes am i excited hell yeah I mean, okay. Canada, USA, that game's going to be at midnight on a Saturday, I believe. I'll be up watching that one. Oh, I don't don't get me wrong. I'm excited that it's going to happen. So right now, it is scheduled. I want mm-hmm. them to go. I'm excited. I want to see best on best hockey. I don't understand why they're still doing the All-Star game. That blows my mind. Um, I guess the NHL still wants their hand in that somehow. But well, uh, right now right. with the Olympics... Yeah. If they're going, they're going. I'm excited for it. And I, I will be upset if they take it away. And I think the NHL does need to take notice of that, where fans will be extremely upset if the NHL is the one to cause the Olympics to not happen. Well, here's the difference, hockey. though. Here's, here's the difference, though. NBC carries the Olympics. Right. NBC's not a broadcast partner. ESPN wants the All-Star game. They're getting an All-Star game because they, yeah. they ponied up the money. It, it's, yeah. it's, it's about... TV, it's about money. And so, and so and the All-Star Game's always been about the All-Star Game's been a vehicle to schmooze the advertisers and the sponsors of the league. That's what it is. The, the game is meaningless. I, I go, I always have a good time. I'm a, managed to find a good time. And the fact that it's in, in even more so this year, Josh, because it's in Vegas. Oh, yeah. People like are looking forward to that. It's not like it was and apparently they're like, gonna use yeah. the strip for some of the events yeah. too. I've, I've yeah. seen that report. Yeah, and so, I'm gonna dis- yeah, I'm gonna disrespect another city right here. It's not St. Louis, it's Vegas, it's yeah. different. So yeah. I, I think that's it. I think it's a grand event. So I think it the the, the ramifications for TV is why you're seeing the all-star game this year. Oh, so do you think we'll see players pull an Ovechkin and take the one game suspension for missing the all-star game so they can get ready for the Olympics? Maybe, but how many players is that gonna be, Josh? Five, two, one, over. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't think so. I, I think that because they're going from Vegas to Beijing directly, I just think that they'll go to Vegas. They'll be in Vegas. It's not like they're opting yeah, out to, I would to go to the Caribbean, right? It's not like, like they're opting out to go to the Caribbean with their yeah, wives and their girlfriends, right? Yeah. They're going sleep, on a plane sleep right it off so on think, the plane. Yeah, so I think you'll see less of that this season. Okay, that makes sense. What team do you think is the most nervous about their players going over and playing uh, I think about Dominic Hasek when he was with the Ottawa Senators getting injured, obviously that could happen. Yeah. And obviously there's a lot of players where it can happen too. Um, for me, I would say uh, just to be selfish, the Toronto Maple Leafs, because they probably will have four or five guys going and that could be a huge problem. You look at Austin Matthews, Mitch yeah. Mariner, um, you know, go down the list, maybe Morgan Riley, you never know, but um what team do you think could be impacted the, the most? And uh, I guess a lot of people would say, well, the Edmonton Oilers, if Connor McDavid goes down, that's a huge yeah. engine for them. Right. You know, that, that undoes their season pretty much. I think I'll, you could ask me after the Olympics when there's an injury. And I'll tell you, <laughs> so I think you're all, yeah. I, I, right now, I couldn't, I, I couldn't, if I could read the future, I pick all the games tonight, have a three game parlay and just, you know, go to Maui, um, you know, next week. So I can't really tell you which team it is. I think there's some concern, but I think that you always have that concern whenever you step out on the ice to play a game. 
That's right? it's no different if you're playing in Beijing or in St. Louis or in Vancouver. So I think that um, you're aware of the risks. You take risks every day. And you can't, like, if you're going into that, being nervous about it, then that, that you're already losing. So I don't think the players are going in worried about that. Um, you go out and play the normal game that you normally play. That's it. Um, so I want to ask you, you touched on Vancouver just a second ago. You mentioned them. Did you foresee the Vancouver Canucks being where they are and what they are right now? Uh, I know when we talked at the beginning of the season here before the season kicked off, um, I said I thought the LA Kings would be a playoff team. And I thought teams like Vancouver probably would be in the upper echelon of their division, but they're definitely not. I'm wondering for you, you look at what LA has gone through the past few years mm-hmm. and you look at Vancouver, uh, at least LA now looks to have a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, the younger players are starting to come to fruition. Uh, Quentin Byfield will obviously be back. Guys like Drew Doughty and, and Cole Pertar seem to have a step back in their game. Johnny Quick this year too. Mm-hmm. Um, but you look at Vancouver and you say, well, what's going wrong here? Um, is it something in the water? Do you think it's a coaching change that needs to happen? What needs to happen for Vancouver to, to hit stride? Well, look, they just extended green, so it's tough to, to fire them. But, you know, guess what? you got to win games. Yeah. You keep losing games. Uh, I'll point at one guy. Uh, Elias Pedersen looks totally disengaged on the ice. I, I don't know what the problem is, but he, he he's not the same player he was that when he came to the league and was dying on force. He's not a force anymore. He's – to be honest, he's lazy in his own zone. Um, not that he was at the best. He's never going to win the Selkie. He's not Jonathan Tage. Yeah. But when I look at that player play, I'm like, oh, there's something going on with the player. So I think I would point at that. And the defense isn't any good. It, it, it has. It, it, it's just – and OEL's been decent. And I love that trade. I love Connor Garland. I was stuck here for weeks. Trade for Connor – for L.A.? Trade for Connor Garland. He's like, but it's just – I don't think it's coaching. I think it's – well, look, I'll put it this way. It's effort. And effort goes to coaching, and the, if they're not giving full effort for the coach, you have to change the coach. And and tr- and, and I know the players, uh, you know, as a unit, love Travis, and he's a good coach, and he's done really good things there. But yep. you know, the additions that Jim Benning made, he's he's on the line. So you have a uh, you know a visible owner in Vancouver. So I, when I started the season, I said, okay, they're not better than Vegas. I loved it at Edmonton. So it's a, at best three seed. Yeah. Now the team that's re- supplanted them is Calgary. Um, they have to start winning games, guys. It's as simple yeah. as that. That's how you save your job. That's how you save your coach's job by winning games. They, I watched them against Vegas. They were so horrific defensively that that's that's concerning yeah. because that's about sometimes it's about scheme, but it's about effort. It's about trying. It's just not there. I think Patterson has attitude has to change. So yeah, if I'm a Vancouver Canucks fan, I'm 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 worried right now. Like they do not look like a playoff team from results, but from effort and attitude on the ice as well. And now they're talking about, you saw the room today, JT Miller for Kevin Fiala. That going to make them better? I don't think so. I, I think JT Miller is a way better player, but we'll see. But they got to start winning games and Travis Green is going to continue there. No, I take a look at that team and I look back at their previous years and I, you could go, you know, last year, year before that, year before that, they had a notable playoff run in, to, into the second round. But you take a look at their overall stats. I believe they were like, if you were to do an overall standings of the last three to four seasons, they finished third last in the NHL. They just mm-hmm. haven't been able to get it together and they haven't been able to notice that and make the notable adjustments. They don't want to go into a rebuild mode. They want to win now. seems like ownership is getting in the way of the GM who's getting in the way of the coach who's getting, everyone seems yeah. to be getting in the way of each other. Everybody wants to go in a different direction and it's just, it, it's hurting them. They all, they all need to get a direction or yeah, a, the formula isn't working, Josh. You're right. The for, it's yeah. not working. It's just it's simply not working, and and and, it's, and you can see it on that. Like again, like the, some of the defensive efforts. Some nights I'm like, what the? Like it should, when you look at the names on the back of their jersey, it should be better. I'm not saying like they're you know just great shutdown team, but they should be winning their share of games, and they're not. And it's it's a comp right when you're losing like this. It's a combination of things. It's not just one thing because if it's just one thing. You would change it. You change yeah. the goal. You change the defense. It's 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 a combination. Like and like you know the old Dennis Green line. You are what your record says you are, and this is not a good team right now. Yeah, I agree. No, hundred percent. Well, I want, before we wrap up here with you tonight, I want to ask the question about uh, obviously we talk about the American Thanksgiving being the barometer point, the the bar point or whatever it is for most mm-hmm. teams. Who is the team that stands out to you right now, Dennis? That's uh, kind of surprised you the most at a, in the NHL. Um, I think Calgary. I'm not a big. I'm not. I'm not a big Daryl. Look, they've had seven shutouts in 19 games. That's, That's a record. Like no team's ever done it. Like, and I don't think much in their roster. I look at, but they are. They bought into the system. They check like demons. 
Markstrom's been fantastic. He's yep. been great. He's worth every penny up there, right? And then yep. you had a guy like Blake Coleman, who's you know got a, you know got rings and stuff like that. It, to me, that's the biggest surprise because I'm not surprised. I look, I love Florida coming in. Yep. Carolina's a demon. They can skate. They're fast. They're smart. Great coach. Maybe the Jack Adams winner and, and Rod the Bod. So they don't surprise me. Edmonton's at the top. They don't surprise me. If I had to guess on like disappointments, it would be the other way. But from a good standpoint, uh, to me, I think it's Calgary. The way they're playing and how they're winning games. Like it's the way they have to win the games because I don't think they're that 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 full with respect to talent. Like yep. Johnny Gaudreau's in the contract year, right? So you know he's going to play hard. Oh yeah. You know, Monahan isn't the guy he once was. Chucky's there, disturbing as he always disturbs. When I look at up and down a lot, Shillington's been great for them. That's a surprise. He's finally emerged. Uh, but Markstrom is the guy. So when people ask me, and people are already asking me in LA, should we be regretful that Daryl is you know here and he wore out as well? I said, look, Daryl didn't coach for like three years. And out of desperation, they called him back, and it's worked. But you know, let's talk about Calgary, not at game 19, at game 82. Let's see yeah. where they are. Let's see if they're depthful enough. Let's see if they get hit with injuries. I mean, I was chuckled because the fourth line right now were three former L.A. guys. One guy wasn't really that long in L.A., but Lucic, Richardson, and Trevor Lewis. You know, you think Dow had a hand in building that line? For sure, right? So, to me, I think the biggest surprise for me is, is definitely Calgary. And I'm a little surprised – at how well Nashville is playing. Like to me, I thought they would be a bottom bottom feeder. And Soros has been great. Matt, Matt Duchesne was great out of the box. And they seem to be finding ways to win. So to me, the two more surprises, Calgary definitely number one, and probably second or third might be uh, a team like Nashville. What about Anaheim? Have they surprised you? Oh, yeah. I'd love to, yeah. Because I'm, I'm in LA and never pay attention to Anaheim. So yes, they've surprised me. <laughs> and so, yeah, Troy Terry. Look, Troy Terry's not going to be the fifth leading scorer in the league. Sorry, he's not going to be top five. Right? Oh, no, he regressed. That right. 33% he, shooting percentage is not going to hold up. He's not going to win with the Art Ross, right? So, yes, they have been great. Again, John Gibson. John Gibson yep. has to stay healthy. He must stay healthy, right? But, look, uh, Getzlaff has been energized by Terry. He's a point-of-game player. He's only got yep. one goal. He's not going to score goals. Adam Henrique has bounced back and has, has done nicely. Um, and there's been, you know, Zegras and Sonny Milano. Like, I didn't have that combination. Like, you talk about pairs, Jamie, right? Yeah. You have Zegras and Sonny Milano. Like as a pair here, the, the producing for the Ducks. Not on my big lot of surprises. No, nope, no. Nope. But I'll tell you, that, like the game, the overtime game that they won. I forgot who they were. I think it was Washington. When Zegers came across the zone, even before I shot, I said, "Game over." I was sitting home with my wife. I'm like, game over. Next game, bang in the back of that. He's such yeah. an exciting player, and like being based in LA, the one regret I think fans might have is. You know, Alex Turcotte over Trevor Zegers. And I know you could do that one if a long time, but Zegers is a dynamic, fun player to watch. I know he had a, a tough goal last year, but the team was really tough. So, yeah, they're a very surprising team. But, again, that's a team that – let's see what they are game 40. Like, can, can yeah. is this sustainable? Yeah. I don't know. But, yeah, I, I Josh, I left them out. Jamie, I left them out. It's a good call. They they may even be the number one surprise at this point in time because I the question with them was, like, okay, they're not going to be a good team. How are they ever going to score? And they're like top three in scoring. So it's not like, okay, John Gibson stood on his head. They played good defense. They're playing, you know, you know, they're checking well. They're scoring four or five goals a night from it, it's some that that's why I love this game. Some things are inexplicable, and their run at the beginning is totally inexplicable because that's not how you think if they were going to win games, that's not how they're going to win. Oh, I love it. They're so much fun to watch. I like I I've, I've, I've been trying to watch more games. I've been watching every Ducks game. I lived in California in 2007 when they won the mm -hmm. cup and yeah. it was uh they I, I'm falling back in love with the Ducks again just because of this team and what they're doing. It's it's absolutely amazing. Agreed. Well, tomorrow night, Toronto Maple Leafs, LA Kings. I'll be chirping you all night long. It's going to be a fun time. Sure. Uh cannot wait to see what happens. <laughs> I expect it. To your one goal game. We're going to see what happens there. Okay. Uh, you know what? I love having you on. Hopefully get you on uh, maybe towards the end of the season. Uh, yes. so both teams are doing, but I appreciate your time as always, Dennis. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. Jamie and Josh, baby, on all sides. Hockey talk. Thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Thanks, no Dennis. problem. Cheers. Cheers. So we have it, ladies and gentlemen, Dennis Bernstein of the fourth period. You see him all over, obviously, uh, the Kings of the Pod there as well. Uh, tomorrow night, the LA Kings, Toronto Maple Leafs taking on each other. Uh, Josh, man, Dennis, always a good time, man. I do have to apologize. I didn't realize that the interview had started 
because I was sitting here with my headphones in and I I was watching the squad cast with Clark Monroe and I was uh, I was watching that and all of a sudden I hear your voice and I'm like what the the hell is going on so i'm trying to f- i'm trying to find the tab that was playing it like do i have an old show open and i'm going through all my tabs and i couldn't figure it out so i just closed everything and then i just see in the corner zoom was open because i had just moved it to the bottom i'm like oh my god it started so i pulled it up and i watched for a couple minutes just to get a feel for where you guys were and then i, I jumped in so i do apologize everybody i was i was here the whole time i was just you were, i don't you, know you were just supporting the squad cast that's all clark monroe and the boys would love that so yeah, clip that for him, but I don't, I don't, <laughs> ah, man, it was, it was, I don't, I was expecting an invite, I guess. I don't know. I just, I just heard you talking I'm like, what the heck do I have playing? And then I realized, oh, I'm, I'm on air. We're live, pal. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that at all. But ladies and gentlemen, this every single week, we will be back in your ears. Uh, tonight, great night. Dave McCarthy, Dennis Bernstein, got the ramble, have some fun. The fluidity's there. So you know what this is. It's offside hockey talk where hockey comes to talk.